This, this conference will now be recorded. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for joining us for this public-private dialogue on energy organized by ECBA and the America's Business Dialogue. My name is Juan Cruz Monticelli and I direct the Sustainable Energy Program at the Organization of American States. And today we will be discussing natural gas as a driver of resilience and energy diversity. And as always, for, as uh, we've been doing for these dialogues, please remember to keep your microphones on muted, muted if you're not speaking. And you're, of course, encouraged to use your cameras uh, when you intervene, uh, take the floor to make a question. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Pablo Steneri at the America's Business Dialogue. Pablo. Thank you, Juan Cruz, and, and good morning to everyone and welcome to uh, this opening session of the public-private dialogue uh, series that will be going on throughout November, co-hosted um, by the America's Business Dialogue in conjunction with the Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas. Uh, allow me once again to thank uh, the OAS and the ECPA team for their valuable support and partnership in putting together um, these dialogues that we have been um, organizing since September. As you are aware, this month we kick off the first of uh, the, the three sessions in November. Um, that will be focused on the role of natural gas in the Latin American and Caribbean energy transition. Uh, as you all know, this is a critical topic, uh, especially in the current context, as uh, natural gas is not only uh, essential for diversification, resilience, and, and sustainability of the energy sector, um, but can also be an important ally to stimulate the economy and improve livelihoods throughout our region um, in, in, in the current context. Um, Today's session is, is titled Natural Gas as a Driver of Resilience and Energy Diversity, Diversity and it will cover uh, the flexibility and reliability of, of natural gas as a fuel source and, and the benefits of pairing uh, it with the increase in deployment of variable energy, um, renewable energy sources, and, and the benefits of, of the complementarity with, with hydropower, um, especially in regions affected by um, for instance, El Nino or La Nina, as a cleaner and more affordable s substitute for heavy uh, fuel oils and, and coal. Um, to help frame the discussion, we will first invite uh, Carlos Inestrosa. He's the LNG Business Development Manager at AES Corporation. Um, he will be providing an expert presentation on how natural gas can be a driver of energy resilience and diversity. Um, coming from the perspective of one of the major operators on the ground in the region in this space. Um, then we will hear from uh, Dax Driver. He's president and CEO of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago, and he will be providing us with a presentation incorporating the views and the priority areas highlighted by the private sector grouped in the America's Business Dialogue uh, that were presented during the last uh, ECPA ministerial held this past February in Jamaica. Um, he will also be providing a brief overview on the local context in Trinidad and Tobago um, in, this, in, in this market as well. And then we will open up the floor and dig deeper, deeper into this topic. And we encourage all of our participants that are connected to the call today to, to please um, ask any follow-up questions or share their perspectives on this topic. As Juan mentioned, uh, please feel free to, to turn on your cameras and to um, intervene freely during that, that section of the agenda. Um, so once again, um, we thank all the participants who, who have connected today and our speakers, and we encourage you to, to actively engage in, in, in the dialogues throughout the month of, of November. Um, so with that, I'd uh, now like to, to invite uh, Carlos Inestrosa. He's a uh, um, going to be providing us with a presentation. Carlos, it's it's a pleasure to welcome you to the session today. Um, the virtual floor is now yours. <clears throat> I believe that Carlos is, is having uh, a technical issue with his audio connection. Um, so 
what we can do is is uh, while while we try to to find a solution to this, we can perhaps go ahead and move on to uh, our second guest speaker for today, um, Dax Driver. He's the president and CEO of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Driver. Uh, the floor is now yours. It seems like we so share my, now... my screen. I hope people can hear me. Yes, we now? can hear you now. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm going to turn my camera off because um, I think my bandwidth is very slow. I'm sorry about that. Not a problem. Okay, so I hope people can hear me okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so let me. I wanted just to, to, to perhaps just um, run through uh, some issues around natural gas, um, looking from a from a, a global, um, a regional, and then a, a little bit of a Trinidad and Tobago context very briefly, um, and then to what the main recommendations were coming out of the Energy Working Group of the Americans Business Dialogue and the White Paper, which we discussed um, earlier this year uh, in Jamaica just before. The world was brought to a grinding halt by, by COVID. It seems a very, very long time ago. We were in Montego Bay in, in, in Jamaica um, and uh, just back in, in uh, the beginning of March, I think it was. Um, so just on, so first of all, just on, on natural gas, um, I think it's perhaps important to look at natural gas in the context of how people are seeing it as a fuel uh, in the future. Um, what I put on the screen there is that the three scenarios which BP are using in their, in their global energy outlook uh, and the role of natural gas within those. So, so BP have developed um, three scenarios. One is um, you know, sort of a business as usual scenario, uh, continuing uh, you know, with a, a similar mix um, that we have at, at, at the moment or similar trends as, as, as we're seeing at the moment. Uh, obviously, that has implications for CO2 and uh, for, for, for hitting the targets around climate change. Um, then uh, what they're calling a rapid transition scenario, um, where uh, you know, the world will make the transition to a lower carbon future um, uh, you know, fairly quickly uh, with, with a lot of uh, activities to, 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 to make those changes. Uh, and then the, the net zero target, if the world was to get to net zero by 2050, what actions would need to be taken? Um, you know, starting from now. Under those scenarios, what you see is that uh, under the business as usual and uh, under the rapid transition, you'll see natural gas continuing to grow as a, as a, as a major fuel source um, over the, the next uh, 15 years or so. Um, but then uh, under the rapid transition, beginning to, beginning to decline after that. Um, the business as usual will continue to grow right through to, till 2050. Um, under the net zero, uh, you actually see a plateauing of the growth in natural gas um, as, uh, ha you know, happening now and then, and, and then uh, declining. Um, what that means overall for, for natural gas is that uh, under those different scenarios, if you look at the, the, the right hand um, uh, graph there, uh, you know, under, under the business as usual case by 2050, uh, natural gas um, you know, growing quite steadily and and contributing 26% of the overall energy mix. Uh, under the, the rapid transition, it's similar um, you know, as it is at the moment, um, uh, contribution from, from natural gas. Um, and uh, you, know, you see the growth there, obviously, in renewables. Under the net zero uh, scenario, if the world was really to, to, to move to a, to a net zero by 2050 um, type scenario, you'd see actually natural gas by 2050 playing its, a smaller role uh, obviously, there's then a, a massive role for renewables uh, on, under that scenario. Um, I think that uh, you know that, that what it tells me that, that the scenarios is that there's a bit of uncertainty over the future of natural gas. But I think that uh, I, I would say that, that there is going to be a major role for natural gas continuing, um, and I think that it's most likely to, to be um, you know, a, a significant role, um, particularly as we make the changes and as integration with, with with renewable energy which I think we will hear more about in, in the following presentations. 
just in terms of with, within the within the South American and Caribbean region now, um, looking specifically, uh, it's not it's not one of the major the world's major major areas for natural gas reserves. That there are, however, some significant reserves, and I think one of the things we often um, don't talk about in the conversation is the fact that Venezuela obviously has these massive reserves of both of oil and of natural gas. Um, and uh, obviously, um, the, the, their challenge is that they have not managed to monetize that, that those massive reserves. So the reserves to production ratio for most countries in the region with with, with gas reserves is between sort of uh, you know eight eight uh, to, to to twenty years sort of as a reserve to production ratio. Which is, if you look at the sort of the, the future of natural gas, is not it's sort of where you want to be. Eight years perhaps is a little on on, on the low side. 20 years is perhaps a bit on, on on the upper side, and you need to perhaps bring on some some more developments. Um, but you know, reserves to production ratios are, are on a pretty you know, favourable sort of um, realm, except for Venezuela, which obviously has this uh, you know a major issue because it has these massive reserves. Uh, they're not it's not producing them. Um, and uh, if you look at the scenarios for the future, the likelihood is that a lot of those reserves may be left in the ground um, in in the future. Um, and also, we should also mention that Venezuela is also flaring very large volumes of natural gas at the moment, obviously extremely bad for the environment uh, and a, a bad waste of a resource. Uh, we have a strange situation in Trinidad where we have a demand for natural gas uh, and uh, just some perhaps 40 or 50 kilometers away, large volumes of natural gas being flared. Um, so this is a problem of, of integration, uh, which could be solved with, with if there was integration between Venezuela and, and Trinidad and Tobago uh, which seems a little distant at the moment but it is a big potential. Um, if you look at production um, of, of the major producers uh, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela um, you'll see you know steady growth um, which sort of happened up in, in, in until the, the 2000s. Uh, we, we saw obviously the, the problems in Argentina with falling production and then implementing some policies to turn that around. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, likewise, very rapid growth between the late 90s and 2010, and plateauing, falling um, production, falling quite significantly, um, implementing policies and some turnaround um, since since then, and uh, us getting you know, production back up again. Venezuela, obviously, with all of the problems, massive, uh, huge declines in their production. Um, Bolivia, likewise, uh, declining production over the last few years um, and issues that they have to resolve. Brazil, however, showing the sort of general growth, and I think projections are for that growth to, to be continuing. So you have a mix there. Obviously, Argentina, Brazil, um, and what's well, an extent Venezuela, um, the, you know, the production there is uh, going into the domestic markets, Bolivia, Trinidad and Tobago production going into, into export markets. Um, in terms of LNG exports, obviously the big story in the Americas is this huge growth of US LNG exports. Um, you know, it was previously a uh, yeah, exports of uh, LNG were in the region were previously dominated by, by Trinidad, with some um, with the Peruvian projects going into the into the Asia Pacific region. Um, now, obviously, we have this big, uh, you know, huge um, uh, tidal wave of 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 the uh, U.S. LNG exports um, coming both into the region. You, you see there you know, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, U.S. Uh, exports into uh, uh, in, into the, into the region, Central and South American region, um, and into to Mexico as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the Trinidad and Tobago uh, exports originally, when our export market you know, we, we, was originally developed, we were going almost entirely into the, the U.S. Um, then we had a transition, selling a lot of uh, LNG into Brazil, Argentina, uh, and Chile. Uh, now we're getting you know, mark, losing mark, market share in those markets to the to, to the U.S. Um, and uh, our LNG now uh, in the last year, 2019, more of it going into Europe, in particular into into Spain. Uh, if you look at the inter inter regional LNG trade, uh, you'll see that the um, obviously the American LNG going into into Mexico um, and um, uh, in, into also Chile, Brazil, Argentina. Uh, and in the other markets um, around the Caribbean, the smaller markets, Dominican Republic, Panama, uh, and the smaller markets in the Caribbean. Trinidad and Tobago, uh, our exports in the region, uh, you know, quite diversified. 
we're still exporting LNG into the US, into the, into uh, into Boston in particular. Uh, with uh, that, we that trade uh, is possible because of of the way in which regulation works, um, and it's difficult for the US to export their uh, LNG into other. So from the US Gulf Coast into the into the Northeast. Um, that so that might also change for Trinidad if the US changes those regulations and you'll get uh, you know the northeast of the US being supplied with LNG out of the US Gulf Coast. Um, but as is at the moment, Trinidad does still export in, in, into the US, um, but our, our regional exports are going a lot more into the other smaller markets, uh, Dominican Republic, Panama, etc. Um, in terms of Trinidad and Tobago now as a sort of a case study of a you know, small economy with, a, with, 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 with natural gas. Um, most, of our LNG, most of our natural gas goes into LNG, in, into the export market. Um, this is, these are the figures for this, for this year, 2020 to date, from January to August 2020. Um, so you know, a large percent of our, of our natural gas production does go directly into exports as, as LNG. Um, we do have uh, then the, the, the remaining um, sort of 40 percent or so um, uh, is, uh, has, goes into a, a domestic market. Um, but the ammonia and the methanol part of that um, is you know, goes into that industry, and then almost all of the ammonia and methanol is then exported. So essentially, that uh, additional sort of um, thirty percent or so, which goes into ammonia manufacturing and methanol manufacturing, uh, there, there is some value added in the country, um, and then it uh, is it, it is exported. Our power generation is entirely from natural gas. Um, and around eight percent of our of, of our um, of our gas production goes into power generation. Obviously, for most countries with a larger domestic market, there's a very different pattern where most of the natural gas is going into power generation. We have tiny amounts going into other sectors, um, you know, small consumers, you know, like manufacturing, uh, and tiny amounts into the transport sector as, as well. Um, the power generation part of the equation is is problematic for the country. Um, in in that we have a, uh, a system of, of, of subsidizing electricity. So Trinidad has very cheap electricity, which has been subsidized by, uh, by, by essentially by the rest, the, the, other, the other pies, uh, uh, the other slices of the pie subsidizes that power generation um, slice. Um, and uh, what it means is the natural, the, the, natural, the national gas company who supplies all of the domestic market, the power generation, ammonia and methanol, has to supply um, gas at a uh, way below market rate to that power generation sector to produce the very cheap electricity we have in, in Trinidad and Tobago. That is a major policy issue which we have to find a, a way of resolving um, and uh, to, to uh, ensure that we are not having to subsidize that power generation um, the slice of the, of the pie from the other sectors because um, uh, our, our major challenges which we're facing uh, in, in our gas industry um, with, with this year with C19 uh, and the decline in demand for products like ammonia and methanol in, in, in the global markets, uh, we have seen uh, petrochemical plants um, being uh, shut in, mothballed, um, and uh, we're seeing our gas production uh, decreasing again uh, after a couple of years of growth uh, um, where we had changed some policies and got more, more gas production. So we now have a lot of, uh, quite a few plants in the country who, who are mothballed um, and um, uh, which is not good because that means that there are a lot of jobs which get shared, there are a lot of contractors who, are, who, who, who were hoping to have work on those plants which is now not coming. Obviously, it means less foreign exchange for the country um, and you know, generally uh, you know, less economic activity. Um, the challenge I think that, that, that a country like Trinidad and Tobago faces um, in this region is really the challenge of the US shale. Uh, and I think this is a, pro a problem for other Latin American and Caribbean gas producers as well. Um, obviously, with the US shale, you've had this downward pressure on uh, the bottom line there on the US Henry Hub gas prices, and they are, have been low. For over a decade, and they were, are remaining low um, at the moment. Um, and uh, obviously, there's a big. Uh, th there have been uh, opportunities in Asian gas markets, in in, in Japanese LNG and uh, and European markets. Um, but within the region, you are, we're basically competing with the U.S. shale gas, um, and that is puts a very strong downward pressure 
um, on, on uh, our um, you know, prices, which we can demand here, uh, that is very problematic then for, for our petrochemical producers. Traditionally, we have petrochemical producers in the country because they were able to access cheaper gas than they can access in the US, and then they would then export product into the US. Um, so if you go back to 2010, you'll see that, you know, that, that our wellhead gas prices were significantly below the Henry Hub gas prices. As Henry Hub prices have come down, um, our gas pricing basically um, uh, at the wellhead in Trinidad is pretty comparable to, to Henry Hub. That then makes it difficult for the Trinidad National Gas Company to be able to buy gas from the upstream producers and sell it to the petrochemical plants uh, at, at a profit. Um, uh, and for the petrochemical plants to be able to compete to sell product uh, into the, the, the US market. Uh, so they can, uh, they, so they have tried to diversify and selling to other global markets, but obviously your transport costs become much higher and you're then competing against European and Middle Eastern and Asian uh, methanol and ammonia as well. Uh, so uh, it is a difficult situation for our petrochemical producers. Uh, and this is just the, the, the challenge, which obviously is created by, by, by US shale gas and the, and the pressure that means uh, on, on, on pricing. So the emphasis in Trinidad, therefore, is for us to add, how do we take the strengths that we have and diversify away from that? Uh, can, are there opportunities in lower carbon petrochemicals, for example, integrating renewables um, to produce uh, hydrogen um, uh, through electrolysis to add that into our petrochemical stream? Uh, to, to reduce the carbon footprint of our ammonia and hopefully be able to access some premium markets because of that. Um, and uh, also then, you know, opportunity, looking at wider opportunities, particularly for the, nat the National Gas Company, uh, the Trinidad state-owned company within the wider region. Uh, which then brings me to the, to the, the recommendations um, from the, 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 work, the energy working group. Um, uh, and what needs to happen to develop the nat natural gas uh, in the non-gas producing countries with, with, within the region. So I've talked a lot about the gas producing countries, but then there are a lot of countries um, in, in the Latin America and the Caribbean where natural gas could be this very advantageous fossil fuel source um, to displace uh, diesel and, um, and heavy fuel oil. Um, and you know, we've seen some of that happening in countries like Jamaica and the Dominican Republic. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for more of that to happen, but how do we make sure we get this, th th this natural gas into these smaller markets, um, which don't currently have access to natural gas? So the Energy Working Group sort of looked at this issue and we came up with a number of recommendations. Um, the first one is around um, to, to, when, when, when you are looking at trying to um, bring LNG in, into these markets, you need to create some sort of bidding process with, with, with standards. So there's a lot of clarity around it, and then you, therefore the, the buying market can make sure it gets the best price um, that, that is available. Um, and uh, you have to, to make sure that each project is sized correctly and, and, and structured correctly for the existing conditions in each country. There's a lot of small markets, and so obviously that means uh, you have to have the, the, the right sized and the right structured LNG project, import projects for that existing country. Obviously, you want to try and find ways to simulate the conversion of existing assets and so moving away from heavy, heavy fuel oil um, to, uh, to, to uh, imported LNG. Um, so you have to find a way of making those conversions happen. Um, one of the ways you can do that and keep costs down is just by using globally recognized technical standards. So everyone knows what you're working on and you're working to the same standard uh, and therefore the uh, offers um, from, from project developers uh, uh, are not competing on the technical standards, they're really competing on costs and that'll help countries get the best offer. Um, there needs to be a, a bigger institutional commitment both from governments and from multilaterals around um, the accelerating the access to natural gas and making those transitions. Uh, uh, and finally, obviously deepening the environmental agenda and making, you know, Increasing the number of countries who are making commitments to reduce their, their, their carbon footprint obviously will help stimulate the development of the, of, of the smaller scale LNG industry within the, within the region um, and um, will uh, you know, help stimulate the, the, the move across um, to, to natural gas from, from diesel and heavy fuel oil. Um, so those are the, those are the, the recommendations uh, which, we, which we made at the working group level. 
um, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to discuss those uh, in, in more detail in the, uh, the Q&A session. So I'll hand back. Thank you, Dax, uh, very much for that very thorough uh, presentation on, on the opportunities and, and the challenges that, that exist in the natural um, gas market in the region. Um, before we do open it up to, to all of the participants, uh, we do want to get back to, to Carlos Inestrosa. Uh, um, I believe Carlos has, has now been able to, to connect, so um, we would love to, to hear from, from AES um, regarding uh, the natural gas market in the region. So, uh, Carlos, it's a pleasure to welcome you to, to the conversation. Uh, the floor is, is now yours. Carlos, we're, we're not able to hear you. Uh, no? Yes, perfect. Ah, okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. And sorry that I couldn't connect. I, I had some issues. I don't know what happened. So I, I'm going to be brief. Uh, actually, I'm going to, to actually talk. And thank you, Dax, for for... The introduction actually I think it, it worked perfectly that I, I'm gonna show our experience uh, now I'm gonna show the experience in VR what we have done and and how um, we have managed to really uh, take advantage of natural gas in in the country sorry one second let me get uh, The presentation here. Um, are you able to watch it? Yes, perfect. Okay. So, so first of all, um, I mean the, the presentation is in Spanish, though. But I, I, I mean, if, uh, I'll do it in English. But if you prefer, I can switch to Spanish. Yeah, English is fine. Okay. So. As you see here, this is our terminal in in VR. Uh, this is our first um, tank, flat bottom tank. We are now in the process of building a second one of 120,000 cubic meters that's going to serve uh, additional uh, demand for natural gas. So uh, I call this presentation uh, "Natural Gas: The Pillar for the Diversification of the Energy Matrix." And in VR has been uh, that has been the experience, and we are very proud that we've been driving that change in 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 the country. By the way, now um, you see that we have a, a new AES logo, so you, you may be one of the first to see it. We just launched it next uh, last week, so so you see now that AES has changed their logo and colors. So, so the, the the main the main issue we're going to talk here is the pipeline. We, we from our terminal, we already had since 2005, we had a, a, a gas pipeline that was going to the west of the country, and connected a, a plant at the, our own plant, we, and also a third-party plant. But now we just finished. I mean, early this year, we finished the construction of the pipeline to the east of the country, which we did it in one year. And this pipeline uh, it has, you know, it's, it's going to allow to convert almost 900 megawatts of, of stock capacity that was uh, built on diesel and fuel oil, HFO. So you see here, we're located here as Dominicana is where I S Andres is located, and there's a pipeline 50 kilometers to the east, and we are connected. All of these power plants, they're gonna receive gas now on. That that that, that is the reason why we are um, building a new a new tank in our facility. So, the introduction of natural gas um, has meant a huge change and have, have allowed to diversify and actually reduce cost on on the country's uh, energy matrix. 
in 2011 we see this uh that that was how, how it was the the generation matrix for VR in 2021 uh you'll see that every um all derivative all is going to be out of the matrix so uh, the main product for generation would be natural gas then is two two very large uh, coal plants that the government put on. But as you see, the um, renewables are 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 growing uh, steadily, but growing. And and the main reason to do that is because natural gas has been uh, the main source of energy that has helped to to in, include more intermittent. And renewable energy in the in the country. As, as you know, VR does not have a strong uh, hydro um, capacity, so so that's why you see that the renewables in VR has grown very slow. It's not the same as you see in Central America, where you have large uh, hydro power plants. So so the the growth in in VR is more on on conventional renewable energy that needs uh, a strong backup to be developed. And uh, what, we, what we estimate is that now that all these new power plants are, go are going to be connected, uh, we are reducing the marginal cost for the market from $85 megawatt hour to $52 megawatt hour. As you know, DR had always struggled with the energy bill and uh, it's, it's an energy sector that has a lot of challenges and reducing the cost of energy is one of the main strategies to to keep improving the, the market there this is our estimation of what's going to happen with the price in the future uh, you see a reduction 30 dollar megawatt hour in, in the minor cost in the next 10 years. Sorry, Carlos, just to, sorry for yes. the interruption. We're, we're only able to see the first slide on the screen right now. I'm not sure if um, there is something on, on, on your end where, where maybe you can make it a full screen presentation or, or, or go so, through this. Sorry, right now you, you don't see? We have only been able to see the the first title slide so far on the screen. I so you you haven't seen any of the things I have been passing. We've we've been listening, but no, we haven't seen the slides. Okay, so let me see how can I maybe. We saw that change now. Uh, now now it's changing. Now it's changing. Correct. Let me see if I put it like this in a second. Of course, if if you can share the presentation with us, we will um, we will send it over to, yeah, it, to all the participants after the call. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's extremely heavy, though. But let me see. Now you see it, or maybe in this format. Are you able to see it or no? No, not currently. No, here. Now we can. Yes, now we see it. Now you see it in. in... Slide number three is okay. currently projected. If you go to the bottom of your screen, right above the microphone and the Wi-Fi signal, you'll see that little symbol. That's for uh, viewers' uh, presentation, so you, it'll occupy the whole screen instead of just uh, a part of it. Yeah, that, 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 that was exactly what I was doing before, but it didn't work, so. Oh. So now, you see it as a whole presentation, or you see just like a, a slide? We see slide number three now. 
but but it's fine if if maybe just try switching to to the other slides to see if they if they work and i think it's fine people will be able to see um in this size is fine yeah sorry maybe i don't know but since we don't use that much this app maybe that's the reason why i have some restrictions on my computer i don't know it's strange not a problem sir let me try again like this so now yep okay so i mean i i, I was this is, this is already talk about this, but this is uh, the pipeline to the west of the country, and we are connected almost 900 megawatts of power there. Most of, I mean, all of that was used to be uh, burning HFO and diesel. So, as I, as I said, today all of them are switching to. To natural gas, so so in 2021, 2022, uh, DR is going to stop using uh, all derivatives for the power generation. So do you see this the the, the new slide? No, we didn't see it change. It didn't change. Yeah, m maybe I don't know. Maybe it's too heavy. So yeah, no worries. It's like, it's not we will Good share it after the uh, after the, the session today with everyone. Yes, but well, uh, at the end, sorry, I couldn't. The, the the message is we 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 managed to do this huge uh, switch um, in DR due to to a number of factors. One is the commit the commitment of a of a private sector to develop this not only in our site as a as a as a owner of the infrastructure but also we put together uh, the wheel of of gas um suppliers like total for example that we had a partnership with them and has allowed us to to really uh, uh, drive this change in the country, but also we we had the support of the government with the commitment of the government to switch the um, the previous energy matrix uh, to what is now. So that is key and has been you know a cornerstone for these 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 changes. Um, in let me put i believe that i can put this one now yep yep so i run to the conclusion conclusions I mean, um, first of all, you know, they are got rid of their dependency on oil derivatives. Now it's a, it's quite it, it has a quite strong diversified energy matrix. Um, in one year, we managed to to build this pipeline 50 kilometers to the west. That uh, that that really uh, is going to show. Uh, you know, you know, on environmental side, is 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 going to reduce almost seven hundred thousand tons of CO two every year, and also the private sector, with the support of the uh, of the state, uh, uh, managed to do this. The main the, the main support of the state was that the government and the regulator signed for these plants new PPAs. For long term, so it, it could they could finance and they could justify the the conversions, the financing of the conversions. So that was 
you know, a very important uh, step to achieve this energy switch. So, so, so that that's an important measure. The government has to be involved on this. It has to be committed to the introduction of natural gas in the country. I mean, if the government is not fully committed, we see it in the art. We see it. We saw it in Panama uh, when we won our first tender. There was uh, an incentive an incentive for natural gas um so so that is uh something that the government has to to help i mean if it's committed to have natural gas in the country and uh, it uh, the number i mean for the, the reduction on the cost due to the conversions uh, it's calculated of 600 million dollars a year for the power sector in dr and and all the new demand that is going to be growing and the estimated would be growing almost six percent per year uh it's going to be served by renewables and natural gas also i mean all, all of these implied a huge investment from the private sector that also benefits the country so i can i don't know if you saw the change of the presentation but yeah we're we're, so, we're able to follow it mm -hmm. okay so, well that, that that is mostly our experience that, that that's what i wanted to to show is how how it is possible to really uh, switch the energy matrix of a country in a short term when you have the commitment of the government plus the uh, a strong private se sector that can deliver on 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 their promises which is a key factor here and is something that we see in the rest of the of the region is that some sometimes when governments do um tenders uh the winners of the tenders sometimes has been people has not been able to deliver on their promises and then you have these projects that are dragging their feet for years and an impact in the, the introduction of natural gas i think that one important step that the government has to take on the adoption of natural gas in their energy matrix is that they have to really um uh take care of who is the the people that are offering to do this uh these projects and really know and really wait on their evaluation of the general tenders or or whatever process they they are on they should be um taking into account the the technical knowledge and the and the really um capacity of delivering on the promises i would say that that is the main the main uh the main um the main knowledge that we got from our experience in the region if you want i mean i can take questions or so thank you thank paulo you. thank you so much uh carlos that was that was a really really uh great illustrative um, example of, of a success story that, that AES has had in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, so I thank you for, for that presentation. And, and now um, we would like to open it up for, for our participants to, to please come in and um, if they wish to, to make any comments or, or react to, to the presentations that we just heard from, from Dax and from Carlos, um, please feel free to, to chime in. Um, you can you can have your camera on if you would like um so so please uh feel free to to make any comments or or questions that you'd like now if participants I would like, yeah would I would also like, yeah 
Pablo, sorry. Yes, I, I think that that last uh, comment from Carlos was very revealing, and you know, the issue of of uh, making sure that whomever uh, takes on a project wins a bid is able to develop that project because that could uh, delay uh, you know any process where a country sees uh, a transformation or change in the energy sector. And I'm I'm wondering, you know, I, I think uh, Carlos was very specific. I wonder if if he can give us more. Uh, of a background or elaborate on, on what he sees as, as the right measures a government can take to make sure that, uh, you know, bidding processes are successful. I mean, obviously doing due diligence, but what else? Is it uh, a matter of, you know, procurement rules or if he can elaborate or anyone else can elaborate on that, I think that that'd be interesting. I mean, definitely one, 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 a step that they, the government should take is to to have a, a strong weight when they evaluate their proposals, you know, under a tender or, or any process. They have to do a strong weight on the experience and and the the, the experience and 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 the, the I would say the size and the capacity of for the company to to deliver. Sometimes you you find um, sometimes you find this uh, we 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 call it briefcase briefcase company that goes into a tender. They they manage to find. I mean, if you go international market to find LNG, you would find anyone that is willing to to give you a contract with no any string attached. To participate on those tenders, so so sometimes you see these these companies they arrive and they have an FSRU sign, which is not 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 that hard to find. Then you have a supply of LNG and that's it. And and but in the reality, when they try to finance, and you've seen you've seen it in in at least for example Central America. I mean, on top of my head, I can think of seven projects that has that hasn't been built, but they make noise. Uh, on the on the market, so I think that the first thing is that it's very very important that governments take into account seriously who are the guys that are participating in these tenders. I, I would say that I mean in in that in that sense it would it would be uh, the main the, the main the main. Important. Obviously, the, the other part is that you actually uh, commit the government to have natural gas. So that that's important. I'd like to to acknowledge a question that came in through the chat from Virginia Angelica Barreda. She's asking, is it possible to develop petrochemical in LATAM countries if United States has cheap natural gas with shale gas? I'm not sure, Carlos, if uh, you have any. Yes, I mean, I, to that. The, the, the issue there is that if, if you are if you are competing, um, uh, in reality, what happened with the petrochemical um, plant is that uh, the energy component is very very high, so prices pricing differences, uh, it it gets a lot of of uh, it takes a lot of competitive competitiveness to to the plant so to do this petrochemical plant so when you need to deliver LNG even though it's quite cheap in in US it's a still I mean the, the the LNG logistics are expensive so when you when you try to have a petrochemical plant in some country that needs to get the uh, the gas from an LNG uh, supply chain for sure, it's going to be hard for that petrochemical plant to compete against any plant that is connected to a pipeline in in U.S. or or any other country that has uh, gas. So I would say that um, that I'm I'm not an expert on the petrochemical um, sector, but but I, I I would say that that you have a challenge on the competitive competitiveness of of the fuel price on having you know 
put in petrochemical plants in countries that do not have natural gas, their own their own natural gas source. So. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes, so I could perhaps respond to that question around um, de developing petrochemical plants. So in, in Trinidad and Tobago, when we st start to have um, uh, gas production and shortfalls going to our petrochemical plants, and around 2012, 2013, we looked into the possibility of importing LNG uh, to, to, to run the petrochemical plants, and it just is not feasible. Uh, the economics just don't, don't, don't work out uh, for that to, to operate. Um, See if, you could, if we could source cheap, a cheap supply of natural gas from Venezuela, um, that would be a, that would be a, a, you know, a possibility for pipeline gas. Um, but the challenge really for the country is to find ways of making sure that we can produce gas cheaply in country. Um, obviously, we are producing uh, offshore gas, so larger fields. Um, moving into deep water, there's, there's, we have significant gas reserves uh, in deep waters. The challenge is to ha how do you how can you be really efficient and develop those at a, at a price to deliver to the petrochemical plants where you can compete with with, with Henry Hub. Um, it is a challenge. You have to be very very efficient in how you go about the project development. And I think one of the challenge for governments, or certainly the government of Diego, is that you probably cannot extract the same resource rent from that gas development as you could in the past. Um, so the, the, the actual resource rent which the government can extract from, from the sector um, you know, de decreases. Um, and obviously in economies like Trinidad and Tobago, you know, commodity-based uh, economies, governments have got used to, to, to extracting rent from the energy sector. Um, and uh, you know, you build, I was talking about the subsidies which have got built up on the back of those rents which get extracted and the difficulty of, of continuing to fund those subsidies um, when you're unable to extract the same sort of rent because you have to now compete with US Henry Hub gas rather, rather than um, uh, you know, much higher price gas in the US and lower price gas in Trinidad. So that's the challenge. It can be done, but you've got to be really efficient um, and uh, you, you, know, you have to have everything in the industry putting in the same direction. Great, thank you, Dax. Um, we have a question that came in from uh, Jorge Lemke. Um, he's asking, with respect to the uh, regional electric market in Central America, um, is it not more effective to transport electricity um, and not natural gas um, through pipelines or ships, which require heavy investments? What, what is your perspective uh, in this regard? And Jorge, if you would I like mean, to, to come in or expand on that, please feel free to come in. Um, hi, uh, good morning. Yes, I am just wondering, uh, in the specific case of the regional market uh, for electricity, uh, uh, we have been looking some huge uh, me mega projects in Panama, there is another in Salvador, and they just announced another one in, in Nicaragua. Uh, but these projects require a lot of investment in, in seaport facilities uh, for transport, and it depends if it's going to be liquid, liquefied gas or not. But uh, we believe that uh, using and generating power, electricity power uh, at near the source of gas and transporting through wires could be more effective and cheaper for the region. I, I can answer uh, that. We, we in AES, we, we've been, I mean, we actually were the first uh, company that signed an uh, inter-country uh, contract on the market, on the regional market. We signed a contract on between a plant, a uh, power plant in in Guatemala to provide, uh, provide electricity to El Salvador. Uh, that experience wasn't the best experience we have, we've had. 
Um, as we know, um, everyone that, that works on Central America knows, the uh, although CEPAC has been uh, quite interesting and uh, I think that some countries have taken advantage a lot of, of the infrastructure, it has a lot of regulatory challenges that make it very hard for anyone to invest in a plant in a country and and have long-term contracts on to supply long-term contracts to another country. Um, so, so although it it could be true that uh, and 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 for sure it might be true that that it's cheaper to move to move to move electricity through through the through the park. Um, the thing is that the challenges are so high, so high, and the investment for power generation are so high that it's hard to believe. I mean, it's hard to see it happening in the in the short run. The other issue that happened is that the LNG is very, it's a great fuel. So having LNG in the country, it not only helps on the power generation side, which is great, and it has to be the main objective, but it also goes to substitute any other thermal uh, activity that the industry could have. You could have it in transportation, you could have it in bunkering for, for, um, for uh, for vessels and so so having the LNG at your in your country it's a huge advantage so so I believe that that uh, and it's happening you see El Salvador is gonna have it for sure I mean now Nicaragua it's moving and maybe it's gonna have one and we see Honduras is moving towards that also so so we see that getting in LNG in the country has been a big priority in Central America. And 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 in the other side the, the investments for the infrastructure and has been going down. So it could be possible to have competitive pricing for LNG on any country at any size. I mean we in AES we are we are moving I mean we are we're considering many options to to reach even Guatemala from our terminal. It could be done by trucks. It could be done by ISO containers. It could be done with a small scale, uh, smaller scale infrastructure. So it can be done at competitive pricing in in those countries. Okay. Great, thank, okay. You. thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I appreciate that so much. Welcome. We have a, a question that came in through the chat from uh, Juan Carlos Olmedo. Uh, uh, he's asking, uh, uh, and please feel free, Juan Carlos, if you would like to to pose the question directly. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. I have two questions. One is regarding if uh, the LNG market is including makeup process in new supply contracts in order to manage fl uh, inflexibility. And the other, what are other kind of uh, LNG contracting strategies to manage inflexibility? Uh, and, and that's a main issue in the case of Chile, because we have uh, a high level of penetration of uh, variable renewable energy. In, in, sorry, I, I don't know, Dax, if you want to to answer first. I have some comments also. So. No, go ahead. I, I think I think on, on on those questions you're probably better placed to answer. Okay. So, I mean, regardless, in our in our experience, now the things are changing. Um, we AES, I mean, our experience now trying to develop the small scale, the, um, the small scale market, taking advantage of the, our 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 facilities. I have to tell you, it it still we we have contracts with take or pay clauses. Uh, the uh, but the flexibility has been growing. 
uh, and 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 you see in contracts even more flexible every time that we do a new contract we can manage to have some flexibility and having having for example in in the case of dr we've been selling to 70 industries uh almost 25 percent of our the lnd that gets to the first tank i mean that we have been getting for the last 13 years 25 percent has gone to the third parties industries and some other power generation so for them in these 13 years i think we have never collected one penny for a take or pay we have always been able to manage flexibilities using our tank using our own consumption so there's a way to do this and and now for example i mean i'm sorry i talk about aes so much but that's our experience but in we are now in a partnership with total and they are second they have the second largest uh, uh stock of lng in the world and we have been managing to have very client client based um uh clauses and flexibilities to really adapt to a to either of uh of their their own uh, consumption profile through the year. I can tell you that today the take pay is not the same take or pay that you saw 15 years ago. Today you have flexibility there. There's a way to manage that. Um, the market is moving very fast toward uh, more um, spot-based uh, spot market. You see it in the next five, the three, four, five years. Uh, I don't have this, the number exactly, but it's something like 40% of, I mean, the 40% of the, of the long-term contracts in LNG are expiring. So, so you see, uh, a strongest spot based, uh, market is going to be more liquid, which is going to reflect on, uh, on more flexibility for the client. But, but, but on on but to be frank, what happened with LNG is that even for a small scale uh, supply, I mean, if you go to an industry and you put something, you need to invest a lot on the on the infrastructure to receive it. So you really need some time uh, and and some assurance that the infrastructure, which is costly, is going to be repaid, and that is, you know, on the first. The first years of the developing the market, that is the main challenge because you have to finance all this infrastructure. Obviously, one, I mean, five years later, ten years later, once the, this infrastructure is, is there and has been paid for, then you have options. I mean, in, in DR, we have up today uh, industries that just buy LNG by year, each year. They, they change their their distribution company. They they can negotiate. So so flexibility is there and it's building up quite fast in the market. Thank you, Carlos. Does anyone else have any any comments or or questions that they would like to to pose? Are you guys hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, I just want to, to also just a comment from a border exporting country point of view. Um, the, the issues which have arise now around how you structure your uh, your, your contracts um, for exporters as well, given the, the, the flexibility within LNG markets. Um, and Trinidad really sort of got a bit caught out because we had structured our contracts with the assumption that the LNG was going to go into the North American market, um, and then that all changed. Um, and there was a lot of uh, difficult negotiations between the multinationals who were the off-takers um, uh, and the government um, uh, around uh, how the, the pricing structure worked uh, and, and how you taxed um, that, that, that off-take and or how you got back to the world at gas price. So it's something which uh, exporting countries also have to think about how they structure their um, their, their offtake contracts um, and uh, how they tax. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dax. We have a, another question that has come into the, the chat from uh, Virginia Angelica Barreda. Uh, she asks, in order uh, to have a flexible contract in LNG, who must invest in LNG storage? The supplier or the consumers? And does this depend on the, the scale of the LNG? I mean, um, in in general, what happens is that when when the consumer, I mean, it, it could be done. I mean, the the, the consumer sign a contract with the, uh, um, and they they put the infrastructure themselves and 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 try to avoid these clauses. But on, but at the end. It's it's uh, and you'll see it. The advantage of of having someone like I would say AES or on any other of the companies that are selling on ye in in the region of having them with their technical knowledge, their 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 strong uh, relations with this, the manufacturer of this of this equipment, the knowledge of the OPEC the operation and the maintenance of this equipment. Is huge, and this is although it's a technology that is very, very. I mean, you. I mean, it's it's not a new technology. It's a technology that has been used a lot. It's just still uh, a technology that has their their the challenges. So, so can you can you get flexible contracts? Yes, obviously. If if the final customer invests, do most of the of this investment. It can be possible to find uh, more flexible terms, but at the end, uh, at the end, I would tell you that once you see it, and every uh, our experience, and I've been with this in more than five years in AES and and uh, five years before, I would tell you that that every time that they start with this idea, they drop it when they see numbers and we see the challenges and they prefer to have the whole package you know and and just buying the gas from the uh, out of the of the south the the, the rig gas facility and and the flexibility depends on the scale no i, I would say that you, you you can find flexible terms and for any volume that you are you are you are consuming. Actually, I would say that it's harder to find if you have you are a huge power plant. I would say that for those, it's harder to find flexible terms than for a quite small um, supply. And the reason is because uh, for small supplies, you can always manage to to um, uh, to to man you know to deal with your inventories. It's it's not what happened when you have a huge power plant. I mean, it's harder. It's, it's not the same when you need to you, to receive one one LNG tanker every every two weeks than when you just using your like marginal a marginal percentage of the of those low vessels. So. Great. Thank you, Carlos. Um, so, are there any more uh, comments or questions? I think we 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 have time for for maybe another uh, another question. If if any of the participants uh, would like to pose any, can, can I ask Carlos a question? Is that allowed? <laughs> sure, sure. Of okay. course. I want to just ask Carlos what what is he he, he potential. The, the potential of, of CNG, compressed natural gas, to supply um, small markets um, within Central America and, and the Caribbean, um, particularly in cases where you may have um, small producers, uh, where the investment in, in uh, LNG 
a liquefaction that may not make sense, but you could perhaps just put in a, a, a compression facility. Um, is that something which you think ha has any potential um, uh, you know, within the Central America and Caribbean region? I mean, compressed natural gas, we, we've seen it. Uh, actually, our uh, early, uh, when, when, the, um, when we started 2003 in DR, our first, we don't distribute the LNG, the gas, we don't distribute the gas directly. We have uh, five distribution companies in DR that do the distribution of LNG to the industrial clients and the transport and the hotels and, and all the market, the third party market. It's done by this, uh, distribution companies. The first distribution company that was delivering gas in DR it started actually with compressed natural gas. They they put a plant just on the side of our LNG terminal. They compress it and they start distributing it. And a few year, years later, they dropped that idea. I mean, they stopped doing it and they start delivering LNG. And, and compressed natural gas has many challenges. In small, in short, short distances, it's, I would say it, it might, be competitive, but once you get to a larger distance, it's very hard to beat LNG on pricing. I mean, just think about it. Uh, one one LNG trailer, one one LNG uh, truck, uh, it costs two thousand two hundred thousand dollars. One one CNG, I mean, the new technology that, that is around that they, they have been advocating, which is working fine in US, I mean places where they have natural gas, it costs two or three times that. And you can store just half of the energy content. So you're moving with a more expensive equipment, way more expensive equipment, half of the energy content. And if you do it, if you move it for longer distances, then the cost goes up like very, very quick. And and that, that, that is a one, one huge challenge. It's true that the infrastructure is quite cheap. I mean, it's cheaper than LNG infrastructure, but, but it's not that, that cheaper. I mean, when you install one decompression plant in an in a industrial, I mean, we've done the numbers. It could be to one, $1.5 million. For that same client with LNG, it would, be, would cost you $2 million. So the difference is not that high, and the benefits of having LNG, I mean, of moving it, it, and the efficiency of moving LNG is so high that I find a bit challenging uh, to to that. I've seen some offers, I mean, that they that they, they can offer. I, I I just can give you one example, and it's a numerical example. You have one plant that has that uses one TBTU of LNG. That means that with LNG, you will need to receive every day three trucks a day. I'm talking about, for example, one plant that is the equivalent of 17 or 15, 17 megawatt generation plant. That would consume one TBT use of LNG a year. That means on LNG terms, it would be three trucks of LNG every day that they're going to receive. If you do the same, the same, I mean, the, that same plant, try to do it with compressed natural gas, they will need to receive six every day. And if you're moving that compressed natural gas in containers that you have, for example, one, one container a day, I mean, one, one shipping line a week to move those containers, you have to multiply that six by seven and by three. So you're talking about, uh, of having to, you know, buying something like 150 containers just for that client. And each of those containers cost half a million dollars. So you're putting 75, $75 million on container for just one client. I mean, it, it, it sounds quite challenging to, you know, to get the numbers right for that. I mean, with, with $75 million, you can build a whole, LNG is more skilled terminal, and you're gonna serve seven, eight, nine TBTUs a year. So, 
So I believe that compression toga makes sense for 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 close uh, for close uh, for very close uh, distances. And very, I mean, I, I believe in small consumptions and very specific consumptions. Maybe in the islands, that some islands that it's harder to get LNG. I believe, but. Thank you, Carlos, for, for that very uh, complete answer. Um, I think that um, in the interest of time and, and to be cognizant of, of everyone's time, we, we, we can begin to close this first uh, of three sessions that will be held during November on this fascinating topic of uh, the role of natural gas in the Latin American and Caribbean energy transition. Um, I think we can all, all agree that today's session was, was very uh, enriching and, and we learned a lot from our, our guest speakers. We'd like to thank them very much for their time to, to connect today and to share um, their valuable experience with everyone. And also thanks to, to all of the participants that, that connected to the call and to those uh, uh, participants that shared comments um, and questions um, for, their, for their active um, participation. We, we hope that you take advantage of these sessions. Um, we think this is an excellent opportunity to, to engage um, between the public and, and private sector on, on this matter that is of great importance and that will help feed the conversation um, in the lead up to the next summit of the Americas, which will be held in the United States next year. So uh, once again, thanks for everyone. Um, thanks for your time. And we remind you that next Monday, we will have a session focused on global standards to support regional LNG development and new technology for small scale distribution. Um, if you haven't registered already, we will be sure to, to send a reminder um, so that everyone has a chance to to register. Um, Juan Cruz, I'm not sure if you'd like to, to add anything, um, but thanks again to everyone for joining today. Thank you, Pablo. Nothing to add. Uh, I think it was very interesting and it was, I must mention, one of the issues that was most broadly discussed uh, when we met in Jamaica, in Montego Bay uh, earlier this year. So I look forward to uh, our future discussions this month. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. All. Thank you.